Welcome to the Birds and the Bees podcast. This is Braxton Dutson. That's the key. People aren't talking about it. Everybody needs to know that porn is not a documentary. It's not like if we don't talk to kids about sex and sexuality, they're not going to hear about it. They're just not going to hear about it from us. They have tons of questions. They just don't know how to ask them. All you have to do is be one chapter ahead. You don't have to know everything. Mm. Just one chapter ahead of wherever your child is. What do I do about Snapchat and the possibility of my teen sending nudes? If masturbation is against my beliefs, how do I bring it up with my teen while following my values? How do I get my teen to respect boundaries? Hey everyone, this is Braxton Dutson. Welcome to Birds and Bees Podcast. I'm so glad to be with you hive mates once again. If this is your first time, welcome to the show. If you're a longtime listener, thanks so much for coming back and for your continued support for the episodes that we put out. It means so much to me. Dr. Holly Merchman is on the show with me again, and this time we're going to be addressing boundaries with teenagers. We're talking about implicit and explicit communication in the family, how that affects teenagers' behavior, and why what I call the lockdown parenting style is a problematic way to be teaching your teens about boundaries. And we'll also be talking about ways to teach teens boundaries. This is such an important topic because the amount of teens who have access to an electronic device nowadays is so high. And demanding action from a teenager can be as easy as telling a baby to stop crying. Let's just be honest. It is so difficult to demand anything from a teenager, so we need a different way to approach it. Dr. Holly Richmond and I explore the conversations to be having with your children right now to prep them to become teens who know how to set boundaries, setting boundaries with others and respecting others' boundaries as well. We also explore methods to approach masturbation, especially when that may be in contrary to your value system. We also explore helpful conversation starters when approaching teens about sexual health. Because sometimes it can feel awkward, and having a a setup of conversation could be really helpful. If you find this episode helpful and supportive, I encourage you to think of someone who could use this episode and share it with them. We're all growing together in these discussions, and you sharing this with them could be the support that they need to start conversations with their teens and their kids that's going to change generations. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave a voicemail or a text at 385-449-1818 or email me at birdsandbeespodcast at gmail.com. I got a question from a listener the other day who asked if I give presentations. Yes, I do give presentations. I've presented to religious groups, couples, parents, and the topics have ranged anywhere from masturbation and values, addressing out-of-control sexual behavior, how to address, address kids looking at pornography, building faith during intimacy, and building intimacy while you're going through infertility treatment. Check out my presentation page at birdsandbeastpodcast.com. I love these questions from you listeners. Keep them coming in. I, I really enjoy hearing everything you have to say to me. Thank you again for listening. I appreciate you being a part of the hive, and I'm so excited to get into this episode. Let's get right to it. Today, I have back with me Dr. Holly Richmond. Holly, thanks for coming back on the show. Braxton, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me back. I am so excited for this this episode as well, because we have, in the last one we were talking about, you know, building the relationship and sexual relationship and parents with younger children. Now we're going to move into something that parents um, are really curious about and kind of, for lack of better words, fearful of how do we parent teenagers, especially in a world of technology and sex. And today we're going to be talking about that. So I'm, I'm excited to jump into it. Holly, I'm, I'd love for you to introduce yourself again for those that haven't been able to hear that last episode, but tell us a little bit more about yourself and you know, what you've worked with with teenagers. Absolutely. So I am a somatic psychologist and certified sex therapist. So somatic meaning body. So I really, I take into account really how my clients are communicating through their body. And we're going to get into this a little bit more, Braxton, when we talk about implicit communication, but what their bodies are saying as well as what they're telling me. Um, and combining that with sex therapy. So again, that this sex is this, this huge part of ourselves. It's a holistic piece of our health puzzle um, and helping clients, individuals, and couples figure out what's, what needs to work better for them. 
So why and how I got interested in technology and specifically some of the new immersive technologies that we'll be talking about is specifically because of the somatic aspect of what I do. So somatic, we talk about a felt sense. So with immersive technology like virtual reality or augmented reality or teledildonics, which we'll talk about as well, we're not just watching a screen, but we're feeling things. So this new technology is giving us a felt sense of our experience. So just like I'm talking about a felt sense with my clients, like let's go to the body. What is this? What are your symptoms? How do you know you're anxious? Don't just tell me what you're thinking. Let's feel into those bodily sensations. This new technology moves us into that space fairly quickly. We've never had anything like this. So in my mind, I'm like, let's use this as a tool to access the body more quickly and perhaps even more accurately to give people competency agency over their sexual lives. Yeah, I'm excited to get in into that where we're talking the somatic and, and things yeah. like that. Um, when, when you are bringing it into the somatic part of, of therapy and things along those lines, is there a, do you ever get a sense of somatic responses when someone talks about parenting their teenagers whenever it comes to sex? Absolutely. And it's usually fear. Like I really like the whole room, just like everybody, everything comes up. I wish you guys could see me right now, but my hands are up in the air and you know, everybody sits up and there's just, it's a lot of fear. Like what are my kids going to stumble on? What are they going to find? What are their friends going to tell them? What's accurate? What's not accurate? And I think it's scary for a lot of parents because they don't want to be left behind. You know, I think there's a sense for some of us, like my kids know more about technology than I do. You know, how am I going to prevent them from seeing whatever I don't want them to see? And my reaction can be a little bit harsh, but it's like, I'd rather have you have the conversation with them about what you don't want them to see and why, rather than trying to put some kind of lock on their system and take it away. Because I can almost always guarantee that they will find a way around the block or whatever security protocol you put in a place. And again, and that's just fuel to their fire. If this is a secret and you're not telling them about it, they're going to be extra curious because they're teenagers and that's their job. I refer to it as lockdown parenting, where if you're the, you become the warden and the inmates become, how do I, you know, prison break? How do I get out of here? Yes. And it works really well for the first little bit. You know, you may send everyone to the rooms, you may take the phones away and Xbox and all the things and you're like in this house you got nothing well guess what they leave your house to go to school to go to all these other places where you don't have control and it tends to turn into that rebellious teenager type thing of like hmm, interestingly enough you don't have control over me once I step foot out of this house and I hate you or whatever it may be that they start coming back into <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And most parents of teens want their kids to have phones now because we like to be in touch with them. So you can't give them a phone and not give them a phone, right? We give them a phone because it's like our security blanket with our child. I want to know where you are. I want you to be able to get in touch with me. But don't you dare use that smartphone to look up anything about sex. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> Right. Braxton, we talked a little bit about this in the previous issue uh, episode when we were um, discussing younger children, but right. the same applies. And again, this conversation should be starting at four or five years old. And it's differentiating between the idea of privacy and secrecy. Yeah. So privacy is something we all deserve. Sex between adults happens in private. Masturbation happens in private. Secrets, that's for the more shameful things. That's for the things that we feel like we're doing wrong. When we're having sex with our partner, we're not doing anything wrong. Kids being interested in sex, that's not wrong. But to put it under this big blanket of secrecy and put it in this bubble and try to lock it down, as you said, it does make it a secret. It makes it shameful and it makes it more alluring. And to be honest, it causes trouble when they're coming into their adult lives and have no idea what, what real, authentic, healthy sexuality should be. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how much I hear people, uh, men and women both, come into the office and say, Braxton, I just, from a young age, uh, you know, 12, I started uh, masturbating and in my, in my values with my religion or within my family, I was told that was, that was evil or that was wrong or that's bad. And I was, I tried so hard for years and years and years to not do that. But the entire time I was struggling with this. And now anytime I start to feel turned on. I feel like this is bad. I've been married for a few years and I just have a hard time. I, I get up towards sexual 
excitement. And then I, I have to, something shuts it down and I feel shut down because this is wrong and it's bad. And it, it really takes a toll on kids. If we are trying, if we're only focused on, I don't want my 12 year old or my 16 year old to fill in the blank. And uh, we need to, to also look at them as a 26 year old person that maybe in your value system is married or that is a, uh, you know, a 21 year old that's exploring a new form of, of their, who they are as a sexual being and see them in that light versus I don't want my 12 year old to be having sex. Right. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. These conversations need to start early. And again, yeah. I know you worked with people with very diverse religious backgrounds. And for some of those people, masturbation is not okay. That's tough for me. I'm going to be honest. That's tough for me because through my lens, it's a very healthy part of sexuality and sexual expression. And most of the sex people have is not for procreation. Um, and I know some people are just like, it's only for procreation, but masturbation, I mean, orgasms are good for us. There's no other way to say it. For men, it keeps the prostate healthy. It reduces stress. It reduces anxiety. It improves sleep. It improves immune function. It can improve focus for women, pelvic floor health. All of those other things I just said, mood, anxiety, stress reduction, all of these things, orgasms are good for us. Um, but again, that's a little bit of a sidetrack conversation. But your kids, uh, bottom line, your kids, your teenagers are going to be curious about masturbation, probably want to masturbate. If you can have this conversation with them in a sex positive, healthy way, I always encourage it. Yes, as do I. Having the, the conversation with them um, in a sex positive way is is optimal. Speaking to that, because I live in Salt Lake City, I work with the vast majority of individuals who identify as a part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and really any cultural or any religion that uh, that tends to be a little more on the side of this, we have set boundaries for sexual health, tends to say that masturbation is not not appropriate. And so for those of you who identify with a, with a religion or a belief or your values are like, no, we don't allow, we, we've decided we don't want our kids to masturbate or that's a part of our, our values. I talk with parents about this of saying it, it is a natural part through, through studies and research. We, we know that wh whether you talk to your kids or not about sexual health, to say you were able to keep them in a bubble uh, masturbation would still occur. It's a, it's a body self-regulation, just like you would with wet dreams or um, anything along those lines. And so take that into account. This doesn't have to mean that you go up to your kids and you're like, hey, heard about masturbation. It's a, uh, this is how you do it. And you should probably do it this many times a week and blah, we're not, you don't have to push for masturbation. But at the same time, the main thing is we want to try, you're asking to go in between and do a balance between what is a natural part of our body as well as balancing what uh, what your values look like. And that's that can be really difficult. So as we're balancing these two, you may say, well, we learn from our scriptures or from our, our religion that, uh, that this is something that we should try and control. And we want to not, we want to, to have some mastery over this, but we also understand that it is a natural part of our bodies. And so when you masturbate, and the wording I use is when, and sometimes kids won't, but the vast majority will, you can, you know, there's, there's ways for us to, to work through this and to be able to know that you're, you're a very normal child and a very normal person. And we, we want you to be able to try and follow the values, but we don't want you feeling shame. We don't want you feeling like you're a bad person because that doesn't make you a bad person. This is just a value we're trying to work towards. We're not going to reach perfection in it. You know, you can talk about these things in a way that is also strength-based and sex positive. Um, that's more sex positive than don't masturbate. If you masturbate, you are risking, you know, sin and going to hell. Uh, because in all honesty, the masturbation may still be occurring. And what they will do is they will shame drive secrecy. And so you'll end up having a teenager or a child that is in secret masturbating, in secret um, and I've heard many times harming themselves, harming their genitals, things along those lines to try and stop the masturbation. They don't understand what's going on. And so your kids could be hurting themselves. They could be thinking of suicide. Um, there's a lot that goes into this when we're thinking long term. Um, and if we can just let them know this is a normal part of you, we have these values, but it doesn't make you a bad person. We want to give you support and we are not going to think of you as a bad person. That is some one way 
to try and balance both of those, but you still have to have the conversation. And that's just what I'll put out there for, for individuals that are more of like, Oh, I don't know about masturbation, but keep that in mind is, is Dr. Holly um, is, is talking um, about this and bringing masturbation into the conversation. A hundred percent. Every, everything you said. Yes. So we want them to know it's normal. They're not bad for doing it and they are loved. Right. Yes. So they are still loved. And um, you're just your language about perfection. It's, it's a construct. Perfection is a construct. It's not a, it's not a reality. And if parents are honest with themselves, of course, none of us are perfect either. And again, this is hormones, hormones, drive masturbation, hormones, drive so much, you know, of this physical development that's happening. It's not like your kids are saying, I want to masturbate because I want to do something my parents don't want me to do. It's literally like a, it's a physical release. It's, it's a part of normal, normal development. Yeah, I'm curious. One of the things that we were yeah. talking about, this is we're saying, like, how are we going to talk about masturbation? Yeah. One thing you were talking to me about and we were discussing was implicit versus explicit teaching in the family. Tell us about implicit and explicit teaching. Yeah, absolutely. And this, it's just, it's perfect for, for talking about masturbation. It's perfect for talking about first dates. It's perfect moving into the technology realm here. What do you text? What kind of pictures of yourself do you send? What kind of information do you readily give to people that you might not know that well? So implicit language, implicit communication is things that we mostly do through body language. Um, It's the unspoken language. So that can be through body language and it can just be in what we don't say. So you've seen so many parents do this. They're talking, they're talking, and then it just stops, like full stop, quick stop. And the kid's standing there looking like, I know there's more to be said here and I'm really confused. I'm not understanding, but my parents just did a full stop. Nothing more is getting said. I'm getting sent to my room and I don't even know what I did. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, so yeah. that implicit communication where the body language, the parents fold their arms um, across their chest, say, go to your room. The kid is very confused about what is going on here um, versus explicit communication where those are. That's exactly what we're saying. What we're saying is what we're feeling. And I would love for the explicit communication to be this is a normal part of healthy development, sexual and relational. You're not going to be perfect. You can do this in private doesn't have to be a secret, but this is privacy for you. You're doing it right and you're loved. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to have in the implicit versus explicit. So how are you teaching? Um, exactly. I think one of those, uh, the wording that comes up for me is uh, do as I say, not as I do, um, or I'm the mom and because I said so. And, and kids pick up on that. Like, wait, but you just did. And how come I can't? they're looking at the implicit versus explicit. And if implicit is countering the explicit or it's not even being met with explicit, then confusion can ensue and frustration can happen. Of course, of course. And when this is around the sexual piece, it just, it gets messy for young adults. So, um, you know, mom is saying we don't drink and we only have sex with, you know, our partner. But meanwhile, kids might see mom getting ready to go on a date and she has a glass of wine with her hand and she comes home late and they're like, they're filling in the blanks, right? Whether whatever mom did was what they've talked about is okay. Or whether mom didn't, the kids are filling in the blank. So it would just be so much easier to say, I have, this is my private time. This, these three hours I'm going out to do my thing your home with your grandma or whoever it is. And when you need your private time, you let me know. Um, just to have a conversation about it instead of, of like, yes, these contradictory messages. So as you're saying that, one of the things that, uh, that I think of, uh, the main app that I can think of is, uh, you know, Snapchat and setting up boundaries around that or even teaching about it. I can see how implicit and explicit values or implicit and explicit uh, teachings can really come into play when it comes to apps and technology. How does a parent start talking to their kids or encouraging teens to, uh, to follow through with rules that they want through implicit and explicit teaching as well as with apps like Snapchat? What are your thoughts? We talked about this a little bit in the previous episode. And again, it's why I encourage parents to start talking about sex at an early age. So again, know your child and know what they 
they can take in. But four or five years old, we're starting to talk about boundaries and healthy boundaries. And they see mom and dad set healthy boundaries. And this can be around sexuality and relationships, but it can just be around, you know, chores and what we're responsible in the house and how we treat each other. So again, like with, with Snapchat, for sure, this is a favorite that young teens use. What are the boundaries they have? Like, so I always start with, if I have the teen, if I'm speaking with the teen or the parents are there, how did you feel when you set, sent that photo? Like, right? It's usually about sending photos and then the parents find out they sent the photos and the whole world explodes and everybody's upset and someone's grounded. Someone doesn't have a phone forever. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad are fighting about what the punishment should be. You know, mom thinks it should be two weeks. Dad thinks it should be two years. (laughs) Yep. That lockdown parenting comes in hard. (laughs) Yeah. The lockdown comes, but the conversation about boundaries should have started in early childhood right? So the, again, the child learns, oh, I can set some boundaries. Of course, my kids can't tell me no to really important things, but if they've got a no about something small, I let them have their no's. Like our no's, that's how a child learns how to set boundaries, right? And no is one of our first words because we're trying, these little humans are trying to say, I need some autonomy. And that's exactly what a teen is doing with Snapchat. I need some autonomy. I'm figuring out who I am, what my boundaries are, what makes me feel good, what doesn't make me feel good. But it's hard if everything for a child has been a lot of no's and a lot of secrecy around the sexual and relational components, and then they're 13 and 14 with a phone in their hand, and they're faced with a decision about whether to send a topless picture or a picture of themselves with a really low-cut shirt on. And in that moment, because they haven't been taught good boundaries, they send it. And then, like we said, they, they come, maybe they come to their parents and like, oh my gosh, I did this. Or maybe that picture gets sent around school, which is illegal. Um, Braxton, you know, we, we know in every state, this is different about pictures of young kids. So there's that to take into account too. But apart from the legality of it, how are these kids feeling? Because a lot of them don't feel good after they send these pictures. And it's because they haven't had this installation of good boundaries with this explicit communication of like that we just don't do that in our family our boundaries are solid this is what we're comfortable with Mm -hmm. definitely one of the things that i hear the most is we've got uh the competing drives we have a teen that is like i don't feel comfortable sharing or sending a picture of me half naked or in whatever situation and what if it gets shared and then there's the other side of, of social acceptance which is a normal question and desire for a teenager to have. And that tends to be the one at that moment that wins out. I want to be loved by my partner or my sweetheart. I want to be able to uh, feel cool. Or um, in Utah, just recently here locally, we had an LDS boy that was about ready to serve his, uh, his two years as an LDS missionary he was sending around and ex- extorting uh, young girls where it's like, send a, send me a topless picture, or ten- send me a bra pic, or I'm going to send a picture of your face posted on a naked body and say it was you. And then he'd get one picture from them and then say, if you don't send me another one, I'm going to send this to this person. And, and one of the girls was saying, no, I don't feel comfortable with that. He said, okay, I'm going to turn your name into this gang and you're going to get they're going to come rape you. I mean, there were some very explicit things that were happening um, to get these pictures, um, very explicit wording, things along those lines. And and the reason he was, uh, this stopped, he did this with many girls, but one of the girls said, mom, I don't feel comfortable with this. This boy keeps telling me that this is what's going to happen. Is it going to happen to me? And mom was able to say, it's not going to, we're going to go to the police. Thank you so much for approaching me about this. But a lot of the other girls that continued to send these photos were doing it out of the shame and secrecy and, oh, no, I sent one and now I'm going to get in trouble. So I better keep this thing so I can keep the secret going. And it thrives off of that. And they just didn't know that that could be a possibility. Absolutely. And Rex, and that's a, a perfect parallel. And that's, I mean, that's a very bad case scenario. It's not the worst case scenario, but it's a horrible case yeah. scenario. But you're right. The one child who is like, I'm just like, this is not right. My mom is not going to freak out. She's going to ask me how I 
engaged with this guy in the first place, right? I'm going to have to have that difficult conversation and say, well, yeah, I met him through blah, 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 whatever that was. Her mom's not going to be thrilled. You know what? Her mom is so much happier than if she was three months into this and it's happening like it is with the other girls. So again, it's just, if we start these conversations about sexuality and relationships and what's private and what's secret and what parts of ourselves we share. And I'm not saying there's any right answer here. I'm not saying a girl taking a picture of herself with a low cut shirt on is wrong. I'm just saying the girl needs to decide if that's right for her, how it fits within her family. But again, feeling that freedom to go to your parents before it gets so bad and saying, this is what's happening. Yeah, definitely. And I think another part of this conversation is the, uh, um, first, they caught the the teen that was doing this, um, and he's being charged severely um, for in, in Utah law, at least. And the uh, the other conversation that I think needs to happen is for, hey, if you start asking people for pictures, that is in Utah or whatever um, in your country, in your state, in your providence, what is legal, what's not, as well as saying like, hey, this is what consent is. We were talking about it in the last one where it's, you know, consent and pleasure. And if you're extorting people or telling them they have to, that's not consent and it's not pleasurable for them. And if it's just about you, it sounds like we need to, you need to change your, your attitude about it. But this is again, a very explicit conversation to have with young men and young women about why they shouldn't do this as well as what, uh, what it means to be able to send a photo if they desire they want to and what consequences could come from it, good and bad. Right, right. So this is, I feel like it's coming back to sex education, which if yeah. our kids are lucky enough to get it, it's about what not to do and it's about a sperm and an egg and it's all anatomical. Sex education does not include a conversation about pleasure. And mm-hmm. yes, our sex positivity model, all sex is good sex as long as it's consensual and pleasurable. I'm thrilled now that we're talking more about consent ever since the whole Me Too movement and Time's Up movement started. Like consent is kind of at the top of the food chain right now, right? So I think young women and young men are feeling more empowered to say no or going to parents or teachers and saying, hey, I did not give consent for that. And with technology, of course, he took a picture of me. I did not send that. He put my head on a body, like all of these things that can happen now with technology. But pleasure also has to be a piece of this. And if you ask kids, is it pleasurable for you to send these pictures? Is it pleasurable for you to to sext with your partner? Sometimes you'll get a yes and sometimes you'll get a no. I don't like doing it all, but I feel like I have to because everyone else does. Exactly. Yes. Pleasure Pleasure has to be part of this conversation between parents and their kids. Which brings me to the next question I have for you. What are some ways that you encourage parents to have a conversation that can be deemed as uncomfortable. Hey, do you find it pleasurable to send photos of yourself to other people? Some parents are going to say that is an uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. So just switch it up a little bit. I love starting conversations with, Hey, I'm curious, dot, 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 and kind of fill in the blanks. So for this one, Hey, I'm curious, how does it make you feel when you send that picture, you know, to your sweetheart? Hey, I'm curious, do you get nervous when you send pictures like that or when you use that kind of language? Or, hey, I'm curious, where did, how did you learn to to sex like that? Like if a parent stumbles on a, a sexting message, which so many do nowadays, right? So it's coming at the conversation from a place of curiosity, which will almost always keep your teen out of complete defensiveness. Mm-hmm. So if you come and say, you did this. I can't believe you're doing this. You're bad. That's not what we do in this family, but rather go with, Hey, I'm curious. You're essentially asking, Hey, I'm curious how this happened and how it makes you feel. The team will be much more likely to respond. And Braxton, I think you and I talked about this a little on our first conversation. If you live in a place where you drive, teens are great at talking in the car. So almost always with couples, I'm encouraging direct eye contact. I'm saying, don't do this over text. Don't do it over a phone call. Let's wait till you're both in the same place and can look each other in the eye. So you're getting the body language. You're getting all of those cues. With teens, it's a different story. Put them in the car, put them in the back seat, or even sitting next to you in the front seat where you're not making direct eye contact and there's something else going on. I've had the experience that teens are a little bit more open that way. Yeah. And there tends to be a, an implicit, an implicit end to this conversation 
they know they're going on um, a trip to the store and you know. And so there's, there's a, a definite start and a definite end. And so even though you're not saying, hey, we're going to talk for about 10 minutes, um, you're like, hey, I am curious about fill in the blank. And they know it's like, oh, geez, okay, this conversation is going to go for about 15 minutes because it's going to take us that long to get to the store. Yeah. <laughs> that allows for, okay, I can open up just for 15 minutes. I can do this for this long. Mom or dad is not going to jump all over me and drag this out for a few hours. Um, there's a kind of a trust that can jump into that. Absolutely. And, and parents, I get it. Like we, we come at this from a place of fear. Like we want to keep our kids safe right? Like we want to keep our kids safe. I guess my message is how do we keep them safe and how do we keep them sexually healthy? And we know that healthy sexuality develops early, earlier than most parents are comfortable talking about. But if we start having the conversations at a younger age, and again, age appropriate conversations that are just about privacy and boundaries and how we keep those, it just makes things when they're teens so much easier. And I just, I have these stories of these fantastic parents that come in and like, you should have seen my teen set this boundary. Like it's so, but we have to give them that power. And unfortunately it starts with us. They're going to practice those boundaries on us, right? Yes. So we have to allow it, but then they get to move out into the world and practice it with their friends, their peers, let's say for 20 somethings in the office place, you know, the whole Harvey Weinstein thing, then they get to practice it there and say, uh, no, that's not okay. You can't sexually harass me. So I just, my point is that this is a continuum that just doesn't start with five and mommy and daddy need privacy. It starts with five. It starts with implicit versus explicit, what we're willing to talk about when they're 10, then what we're talking about when they're 15 and they're sexting and they're using Snapchat and what feels comfortable for you to when they're out of our house and in the workplace and someone's not treating them well. They've got those good boundaries built in. Yes. Yes, most definitely. And again, if I can come back to the balance, I love what you're saying. We need to have the explicit talking, leaning into uncomfortable conversations and I get a lot of parents saying, okay, so what's the, again, we, we want to protect the kids. And so then we jump into, okay, so they'll just never have Snapchat um, or they'll just never this. And I'm here to tell you in working with teens for years and years that it does not matter what rule you put down. If you're saying you will never have Snapchat, they will have an account through a friend's, you know, and use it on their friend's phone. You know, they don't need to be on it all the time if they still have one and it's on a friend's phone or a tablet. I've seen that happen. Um, so knocking it out can, can you know, setting boundaries that way can be important. But to rely on those boundaries um, as the only way is, uh, is it's, too, it's too much. You can't control your kid that much. It would involve you keeping them in the house and not letting them go anywhere, which is illegal. So. Right. And it's not, it's not conducive for them. What are you going to do at 18? Send them off and be like, congratulations, you're an adult now. Go do whatever you want. Right, exactly. Yeah, so it's just, it's, it's us getting more comfortable with the hard conversations. But I promise if they start earlier, they won't be as hard because the kids are building on the information they have. Oh, I'm building on that I'm, I deserve to have privacy and mommy and daddy deserve to have privacy. Oh, now I'm building on my implicit communication versus like what I say with my body versus what I say with my words. I'm building on boundaries. What's comfortable for me? What's comfortable in my family? What's comfortable in my community? So each child is different because of all of those factors. Definitely. And some of the listeners may have got on this, on the episode to hopefully, you know, address a specific thing or a specific, how do I deal with just Snapchat? And to tell you the truth, that would be an episode all in itself, just on Snapchat. And there are apps that come out every single day that kids hear first. You can't stay ahead of the technology. It's happening too fast. And so from what you've been saying, uh, Dr. Richmond, that uh, being able to build these, these relationships, demonstrating it, respecting it, them respecting you, showing them, it doesn't matter if they've got Snapchat you know, you set up your rules in the house. If you're like, you know, electronics are turned into us at 10 PM. Okay. You know, it's something that you can control and you can keep and you can stay consistent with. That's important for teenagers. But when it also comes to apps, you know, you can set up different things of like, they can't re-download apps or download apps without having a conversation with you. I always encourage that. 
Um, so setting boundaries is important, but when those boundaries turn into control, I'm hearing from you that the control turns it into a secret uh, battle between you and your teenager. Right. And then the secrets turn into shame. And remember, the boundaries need to ex- expand as the children are getting older. Yes. Right. right. <laughs> Yes, yes, they do. The boundary of a 10-year-old to be the boundary when they're 15, it's just not healthy for them, which pushes them, forces them into a place of having to keep secrets. Yes. Right? So just being more open. And and Braxton, thank you for saying that about technology, because I use technology in my therapy practice every day. and, And a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, I feel like therapy is this last bastion where we don't have to do any technology and it just can be one on one. It can be that, and we need to expand our model because like you were saying, technology is not going anywhere. It's only becoming more of a part of our lives. And for parents out there, it's only becoming more a part of your children's lives, your children's lives, your teens' lives. So trying to control the technology is really, it's not going to be an effective way to do it. Trying to have a conversation and understand your teen, help them understand you, help them again, know that you love them and you're trying to keep them safe. If that's the message without being like so in their face and controlling, hearing them out, that's usually a better way in. I love how you say that. If if some of the listeners want to, um, as you're saying, connect with you, maybe they want to do a a consultation or they want to do some coaching. They have a specific situation that they would love to run by you or or, uh, work with you on. How can they get a hold of you or set up an appointment? How, How do they do that? Absolutely. All of my information is on my website, which is drhollyrichmond.com. So it's a D-R-H-O-L-L-Y-R-I-C-H-M-O-N-D.com. Um, email drhollyrichmond at gmail.com. My phone number is on my website. All of the social media is on my website. So that's probably the easiest way to go. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, it's all Dr. Holly Richmond. I'm pretty easy to find and love working with parents. Um, so please feel free to call. Wonderful. Thank you so much again for being on, on the episode, Dr. Richmond. It, uh, it means a lot. And I really love the conversation that you and I have had today. Thank you, Braxton. Okay. If you uh, have any questions for Birds and Bees podcast, you can contact us at birdsandbeespodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on the, uh, the social media platforms, especially Facebook and Instagram. And you can always send me a text or give me a call, leave a voicemail. I don't pick up those phone calls. So I'd love to hear your messages. That's uh, 385-449-1818. And until next time, keep the buzz alive. And we're going to all get through this together. I promise you we can do this as long as we step into these uncomfortable conversations and know you're not alone. We'll see you in the next episode. This has been another episode of the Birds and Bees podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions about the show, comments, or questions you would like addressed in another episode, please give us a call at 385-449-1818. Leave your voicemail and your question, or you can also email us at birdsandbeespodcast at gmail.com or visit us online at birdsandbeespodcast.com.